I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. Patrick Porter, here we go, dude. All right, let's let's rock. Man, it's been a wild uh, weekend for us. We had the Mastermind with the Brain Tap crew and the Modern Nirvana event. I feel like I have not stopped running the whole time since you've been here. Yeah, our staff was talking. This was probably the most amazing three days. And now this this is the coup de gras doing this here. So yeah. here we go. It's a long time coming. You've yeah. been someone that's been on my list. I have a master document of people that I want to interview and you've been on there for a number of years and I'm just like <laughs> waiting till I run into you in person so mm-hmm. I don't have to be relegated to a computer screen to do it. So I'm really stoked to talk to you. Yeah. So I want to start by asking you, what's the most exciting thing going on in your life right now? Well, right now, just that it's the era of the brain, man. We I've been doing this for so many years and uh, feeling like I was at another planet. Now it seems like I've shifted to the right planet at the right time. And people are recognizing how brain fitness and energy are so important. And it's not a bizarre, uh, you know, when you're talking with the medical world that I am, they always think that's weird when you talk about energy and uh, in the brain, most people think the brain isn't something that can change. Now we know it can. And it just seems like I should have been born now, but somebody had to lay the groundwork. And, you know, luckily we were part of that team that did it. We're not the full team, but, you know, we're part of that yeah. equation. So do you feel uh, partly vindicated? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so most people would have quit a long time ago because uh, one thing you find, if you're, the, if you're the first, like we were when we invented the first light and sound machine, just like the guy that goes out as a scout, you're going to have the arrows in your back, you know, and a lot of people are going to try to tell you that's, that's BS. And when we first started, there was no way to measure it. You know, now with the, with the biohacking world, you know, now we know we can, we can even do it ourselves. Um, you know, of course the clinical solutions were there before the ones we can use for ourselves. But to me, it's like, I've been saying it, been feeling it, but not everybody can feel energy. So they, they have the experience and they, they go, Oh yeah, that was nice. I took a nap or I, it made me stop smoking or lose weight or whatever, but I'm not going to do that the rest of my life. They, they don't, they don't think in terms of evolution. They think in terms of a change, like I want this change, but the reality is that it's, it's a lifetime experience. It's not a one-time thing. And that's why even like the name of your podcast, you know, it's a lifestyle. It's not yeah. like, Oh, I'm going to go do this today. And that's it. I always look for things that are sustainable, that we can, that will improve the quality of my life, that something I want to do for the rest of my life. It's not like when I, all the things I do every day, you know, people might think I'm crazy, but the, the reality is that they've been tested. We can do it. And today in our environment, it's so, it's the most wonderful time to be alive. If, um, you know, everything else would just, you know, leave us alone. Right. So we're the, the key I think is that people are now knowing what intuitives actually feel because at first I didn't even know I was very intuitive, but now looking back at it, you know, when you start inventing things or creating things, that's from that intuitive space before I thought it was real technical and doing that. But then when you meditate and you do those kind of things, you're kind of using both hemispheres. And, um, I've really developed my intuition over the years and, and I think that's, what's really doing it. And I knew inside, you know, when you get, uh, there's been a lot of people, especially because I've come from the world of psychology. So a lot of my friends, when I first started, you're going to take us out of a job. You know, I go, there's at that time, there were 5 billion people, you know, and I said, we can't get to them all. You know, we've got to have technology that's scalable that, you know, we need to change the mental awareness of a planet because we're all focused on the wrong things or a great number of people are still focused on all the wrong things. Absolutely. And what got you started on the journey of brain entrainment in the first place? Well, there was a a company called the Silva Method. And it was a meditation practice. And my dad was a, an instructor and he was a very gifted alcoholic. So, <laughs> he, he, you know, everything would be going great, but he would find a reason to go drink, right? He was, he was an addict, right? And he couldn't get help. AA didn't work for him. And we now know that standing up and affirming you're an alcoholic might help some people. They have a 2% success rate. So, I mean, 2% of the people it, it works for. The other 98% struggle. They go back. So they need to find a lifestyle, really. They need to find a way of living. And the church elders, actually, the priest and a nun came to the house and said, Michael, we want you to attend this relaxation seminar we have. 
And when we, he went to that seminar, they played something called the Silva Sound. It's isochronic tones, but nobody's called, they didn't call it isochronic tones. They just said, hey, this is the Silva Sound. Now, with research, we knew what it was later. He sat on the floor and he got up and he never drank again because it changed his way of, the, he, at that moment, he said, I'm relaxed. He thought he could only relax through the use of alcohol. And there's a really good book called uh, Finding Your Perfect High. It's by John Marshall. And before I wrote the program for DUIs for the state of Arizona, I used a lot of his material because it proved that most addicts aren't trying to get high. They're trying to get balanced. And that was my dad. And so my dad was smart enough to know, hey, I've got nine kids at home. They're going to be just as screwed up as I am if I don't help them. Right. So we're only as we're only as smart as the newest information we have available to us. So my dad started teaching us. And then he then for years we would help set up the chairs, be in the seminars. I've probably done the Silva seminar a thousand times, you know. So, wow. So is that something that still carries on today? Oh yeah, millions of people are doing the Silva oh, method. Wow. My dad was fortunate when Jose was still around. He studied with him here in Laredo, Texas. That's where they where he started. And um uh, you know, one thing that I find is it's kind of like one of the principles of AA, right? Once you get help, you go help other people. And my dad thought, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. And everybody thought he was crazy too. But uh, in, in, there were a lot of struggles doing that. But my mother was a very successful beautician. And we had a 12-station uh, beauty salon, made a lot of money. So my dad didn't have to, you know, struggle with money. He was, he was able to follow his new passion, which was helping people. Went back to school, got a PhD and and then wow. uh, I was never wow. going to do this, by the way, this, this was not going to be my career path. Cause I, you know, when you grow up and you hear your every four letter word, but love, you know, and then he changes and you don't really believe it as a kid. Yeah. yeah. But then he, he said, you don't have to do what I'm doing, but let's do this for sports. So I actually created my very first affirmation tape that I woke up to because I found an alarm clock that would wake up to the sound of a cassette. You could put a cassette in there. And even to this day, I recommend people don't use alarm clocks. You need to wake up to something that's pleasant because our nervous system's listening all the time. You don't want to just shock it, you know, and, or wake up at your own time. You know, once you, in Silva, they taught something called sleep and weight control. So once we, once we got into that, and then there's a unique story, maybe we can get into it later, of how I found the technology. And that's really what got me on to everything we have going now. It was a, a series of uh, happy coincidences that, that happened. And it was actually predicted by someone that and a lot of people think that's weird. But I've had, I've had my, my first book, I was talking to Allison this weekend, and I've written a book called Shamanism in the 21st Century because I have a series of spiritual awakenings. I, I tell people, you don't have to wait till your midlife to have your crisis. I could, I had mine at 12. You know, I always tell people, you don't have to have a breakdown, but you need a breakthrough. So, you know, you're either going to break, universe is going to put you on track, whatever you need. And you're not always getting going to get what you want, but you're going to get what you need. And if you're wise enough to understand that, and it's not all, you know, I've been knocked around, kicked around, you know, had to struggle, but I kept that vision and, and now it's expanded. It used to be, I wanted to help a billion people. And since we've blown way past that, you know, now it's a billion. I said, that wasn't big enough. You know, if I could accomplish that in, you know, 20 short years, we might as well go big or go home. And I think that this is a way that people are looking for solutions that are easy, that get results. And, and it, basically helps. It's something that it doesn't have to be what we do. Obviously they can, they have to find a way to calm down their nervous system, find themselves and then show up. You know, you can't just go all the time. You know, the, the American way is let's work hard, work through it and we're going to succeed. But then what happens is we retire and expire. You know, you know, we they're like the salmon swimming up um, upstream. They finally they get their seeds. <laughs> you know, they they fertilize fertilize their seeds. They get their retirement money. They got their golden parachute. Next thing you know, they're pushing up daisies. You know, because they didn't <laughs> they didn't have the they didn't have the future in mind. Right? Yeah. We we got to have that future in perspective. And for me, when somebody says, "Man," because they I quote, "I've already retired once," right? But I'm never going to retire. I mean, there's too many people to help, and and I love what I do. I still get paid to do fun things. I still feel like I'm setting up chairs for my dad, you know, because we, I love seeing people just light up, you know, and, and realize that the solutions within you, and there's a lot of tools to do that. And I think binaural beats are one of them because it's been proven. 
you know, and it's been around since the 1800s. So it's not something I wish I wish I invented it, but it's been around. And, and I like to tell people these everything you see in the world is actually an ancient tradition that has been transformed into modern technology because we're still playing out the same roles, the same scenarios, the same archetypes. And, you know, who are you playing? You playing the victim or are you playing a superhero? Because if you're if you're playing the victim, you haven't elevated your story to get your you know, you got to get your superpower. And mine happens to be what I do. You know, I, I could have, I tried to do other things, by the way. You know, when you become successful, you think, well, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do this other thing and that thing. And then I've realized after failing really quick that this is what I do. And so I just stay with it. And yeah, I'm like a dog with a bone. This is what I do. You know, and as long as it has to do with light, sound and vibration, I'm all in. You know, there's a lot of other things that are good and people can do those and I'll support them and, and, and use them in our clinic. We use a lot of different technologies that aren't mine, you know, because I think there's a, you need more than just one thing. Did any of your other eight siblings pursue similar paths? Oh yeah. Michael, my brother is still our educational director. He's been the steady one. He's my, my, what really got us into this. I should back up a little bit. My mother, we lived in Battle Creek, Michigan, which is the very first health food store in the world. Was, was there. Dr. Kellogg was there. In 1890s, he started doing colonics and everybody thought it was crazy. And we had a Seventh-day Adventist hospital there that was all health. It's, it's, you, you would think it would be in California somewhere, right? But it was in Battle Creek, Michigan. And it was all vegetarian, healthy foods, everything like that. So you had a choice. You could go to Lila, which was, you know, the jabs, the sticks, the pills, or you could go over to the Seventh-day Adventist hospital and have a holistic experience. So when Michael, who's my older brother, he, and I write about it in one of my books, uh, I've written nine, the, the one called Awaken the Genius. I talk about him that they couldn't start school till he ran laps around the classroom. And my mother went to an iridologist where they look at your eyes. And I'm, in fact, we're going to an iridology conference here at the end of the month because I still support them because of how they help my family. And they looked into each of our eyes and they told us about our health. It's like, what? This is magical. You mean the, so now we know that our body's a hologram. You know, but at the time, what they told my mom was, get us off sugar, red dyes, everything we know about today that this part of the, really the biohacking journey or experience, my mother started doing that. In fact, for those that are old enough, uh, I was predicted to replace Ewell Gibbons in the Great Nuts commercials by my friends. <laughs> you know, in, in, my, in my yearbook, it says that, right? And so, because I eat weird food, I brought my own food, and that was because of my brother, Michael. And he still, to this day eats very weird, you know, that people would think it was weird, but we would say he's eating healthy and he's, he's two years older than me and he's still physically fit and he's in there. And then we have, uh, the rest of them do everything that we're talking about here, but they didn't do it as a profession. At one time I had six siblings working for me when I had a franchise company, I used to have a 108 locations around the country. And we used to have, uh, it was called positive changes. And it was, we used to help people with their personal problems. And, you know, it was a, a counseling center and we franchised it. And I sold that in 2002 to pursue other things, but wow. Wow. And what was the work you did in Arizona with the DUI program? When I went into practice there, um, with uh, positive changes, I had to leave uh, one time. I wanted to, I got, I was getting married, uh, of course. And so I didn't want to work for my dad anymore. Up to that point, I was working with dad. And um, so I wanted to work on my own. And I said, dad, you can buy me out or I can buy you out, but I, we can't work together. You know, got to a point where, you know, I didn't want to just be an employee anymore. I wanted to be the owner. So he said, I'll buy you out. So I had about seven months to go open up a clinic and I didn't have anything to do. And a weird story. I always tell people, you got to do what you need to do now. So you can do what you want to do then, you know, it's, you can't, there's no sacrifice for the work. So, um, I was, I had savings set aside and I wasn't making any money. I was walking my son to school and there was a sign in the window of Seven Eleven that said they had an opening and, you know, I'm 24 years old and I think, well, I'm, I'm not doing anything at night. I'll work and I, I don't sleep that much, although I get really good sleep scores, but I don't sleep that much. And uh, usually six hours is like sleeping in, you know, so, <laughs> oh, wow. so, so um, because I'm doing, I'm doing the brain tap. I, I've been doing yeah. it since 1986. So never missed a day. So you, you, your nervous system stays peaked. What so, do your HRV scores look like? I know that yeah. you, you can't really compare apples to apples because everyone's you know, physiology yeah. is unique. Yeah. I'm just curious though. Usually mine is around an 80 to 85%. Oh. Um, but the, if I do a session, then I can get it up to around hundred. 
Wow. You know, right afterwards, but you're going to have, that's a halo effect. You know, that it's yeah. gonna, I'm 60 now. So as, as you age, we've got to, with the biohacking though, I found that I've done, did two liver cleanses before coming out here. It really boosted my scores because, and I, I learned that from a doctor group. He was telling me that uh, most people have only 15% of their liver working. So I said, wow, that's good. And, and I had a problem when I went to the doctor, he said I had too many red blood cells. And I said, I have thick blood. So he said, this is what I need to do. So, and I will know when I get to California, because that's where I'm going next, I'll get my blood checked again and see how it worked out cool, and cool. things like that. So 7-Eleven. Yeah. So 7-Eleven, I'm, I get a, I go in there and they, I didn't tell them I was Dr. Porter. Obviously they wouldn't hire me to work at 7-Eleven, but a weird story. I'm, I'm sitting in there and, and I have a, almost a photographic memory, uh, a didactic memory. And so when somebody came in to buy beer at night, it was the middle of the night, kind of bicycle. He looks like a kid. I asked him to, for his ID, he shows me his ID. He's old enough. I sell him the beer. The next morning, this was overnight. I only worked at night so I could work during the day on other things. And I get a call from 7-Eleven saying, hey, yeah, we need you to come into the center. We have to talk to you. And I'm like, wow, what happened? They see me eat a cookie or something? You know, I don't know <laughs> what's going on. So I walked down because it was just around the corner from where we were living. And I get in there and they show me this video of me at the counter showing this guy's doing his thing. And and they said, do you remember that? And I said, yeah, because there's like only four people in the middle of the night <laughs> came into 7-Eleven. And they said, do you know where he went? And I said, yeah, I know exactly where he lives. They go, how do you know that? I said, yeah, I had to look at his ID. He's over there in apartment 104. And they said, really? And they went over there and they got him. He was sitting there. He had just shot a guy two blocks away who was the sheriff's son. And do you remember it because yes. of the memory you have? You yeah. got, looking yeah. at the ID? And, and they didn't know where he was. Whoa. And, and so they tracked him there and they went there and they, and then that's when the guy running 7-Eleven said, who are you? And I said, I'm just Patrick Porter, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, then there was a guy I was working with that, uh, actually the first publisher of my book, he heard that I was working at 7-Eleven and he thought, damn, Patrick must be really hard up for money. Must something must've really happened. He's at rock bottom. So I'm filling the cooler and, and I hear somebody open Dr. Porter to the cash register. And I'm like, what? And, and so nobody knew I was Dr. Porter, right? So I go out and he goes, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm spending money just doing things I can make. But then when I got my first paycheck, that was my last paycheck. Because I go, what? I worked all these hours and I got what? It's not <laughs> worth my time. But it was a good story. I actually got a little pin that I keep still because I, I answered all the right questions when they sent a secret shopper in. The, uh, <laughs> but it, uh, his, Jerry said to me, he goes, I have, That's hilarious, I, he, he said, dude. I've been looking for you. He says, there's a group over here, the Arizona Health Council. Vivian's looking for somebody to write a program based on AA, but isn't AA, can be accountable for second-time offenders. And they'd like a meeting with you. So when I went to meet with them, they said, wow, this is fantastic. Because I I'd studied with Richard Bandler and John Grinder and Tony Robbins. All the Tony wasn't really a trainer at that time. He I did the firewalk for $250. That'll give you an, how long ago that was. And but he, when I met with Vivian, she said, if you write the program, we'll sell it. So I wrote a program. They got uh, the request for proposal. They got $60,000 to write this program. So obviously, I didn't have to work at 7-Eleven anymore. And then they let me train the PhDs and, and uh, social workers to give the program. And I made $8 every time somebody took the course. So it was my first taste of re reoccurring revenue, right? So that's been my history since then. You know, uh, I always like to say every day I make a little bit more than I did yesterday because yeah, the more people you help, the more money you make. So that got me into it. And then they used the program for about three years. And then, of course, something new came along. And, uh, but I, I, we always figured if you get caught once, maybe that's an accident. I don't believe that. I think the universe was already telling them, hey, you got to take a look at this issue. But when you get caught twice, you know, uh, driving drunk, you probably should look at that. So we, we were, it was an intervention seminar. It was really a, uh, it actually is the book Awaken the Genius. If people want to know what it is, I converted it to a book because uh, I was trying to train these social workers and these psychologists because they were all stuck on diagnosis. And I said, right. they're not the diagnosis. The number one law of psychology states you can't be a behavior. So why are you telling these people they're alcoholics? They're whatever. They're, they, they function perfectly, just not the way they want to work. You know, the, the brain's doing exactly what they programmed it to do. We need to just teach them how to reprogram, you know, and I used to tell people that I'm a software engineer for the human mind. If your brain isn't working for you, I help you write new programs. You know, that's really what's going on. And it's in one day they weren't getting it. You know, I was trying, it was, the program was actually called hidden solutions. And I, and I said, I got to wake you, I got to wake up you guys as geniuses. We were doing the training and we rolled and I just did a little mini NLP seminar, you know, teaching them each of the techniques 
And my wife was in the back and she said, we should make this a book. And Jerry was there, the guy that became my first publisher, because he was supporting me in this uh, thing. And he says, if you, if you write that book, I'll publish it. And I said, Jerry, take out a napkin. You write that down right now. If I write this book, you're going to publish it. And we signed a contract right there on a napkin. I handed him the book three months later. He published it and it became a, a 1994. It was the best self-help book uh, voted to by a couple different exchanges because we wow. sold 100,000 copies in Russia. <laughs> you know, that, <laughs> in Greece, sold a bunch of them. Of course, in America, we sold a bunch too. So Wow, that's fascinating, man. What a cool life you've had. Uh, for those listening, I want to let you know, you can go to lukestory.com slash brain tap. Uh, to get all the links and stuff that we're talking about. So any book you mention or anything we talk about will be at lukestory.com slash braintap. Tell us about remote viewing. I was fortunate. We had an, we used to have a, a facility that actually Michael and his family lived in in Chipman, Virginia, right down the road from the Monroe Institute. So if you want to learn, I'm, I'm a big one. If I want to learn something, I'm going to go to the master. So Monroe Institute are the masters. You know, they're the ones that they got on the scene first. And, and so we were working with them to use their binaurals, you know, and, and things like that. And with our product called the MC square, which was the first light and sound machine. So we found when I was going up there, I always wanted a property when you use your GPS just came out when we got it. And it used to say, you're now leaving the map network. I always wanted to be off the grid, right? You hear that all the time. So we always make fun that, but we had a property there. So we got to meet uh, Patrick Flanagan. And oh, we had wow. meetings with them all the time. And I hired someone who worked for the Monroe Institute to come work for us and teach us some things about it. So I got to sit down with them all the time. Do you, do you, I'm going to just uh, yeah. interject for a second. Do you use the Patrick Flanagan uh, Mega Hydrate or have you ever used that product? No. Oh, yeah. He came up with this hydrogen product. Oh. It's like super powerful antioxidant. Very cool. Uh, oh, great. That's how I know him. And then Patrick Flanagan, he also had this little device. I don't know if you remember the that thing. Or? Yeah, yeah, the Neurophone. Yeah, we loved that. Yeah, yeah. was that legit? That oh, was yeah. one of the first biohacking we, brain things yeah, I ever had. We, and I, I think I lost it at some point and newer yeah. stuff came out and I forgot yeah, about it. We used to use it at seminars to show how we're all connected. You could put, but you had to use the goo so people didn't like it, right? You had to, so we would have somebody put it on the back of their hand and then everybody grab hands and you couldn't hear anything. We'd, we'd take the other one to the other side of the room and put it on somebody else's hand when we're all hand. Now we could hear the message. Now the same message, the same entrainment everyone's doing, and it's going through the bone structure. So, because it's really it was the first, uh, what do they call that? Bone conduction. Uh, but okay. we, we thought that for people, if you want to get directly into the subconscious, you can bypass the neural networks that control the hearing and get it right into the bones. So we used to do like put in sophigeal frequencies and uh, noge frequencies through that and do it with groups you know, 20 wow. to 30 people. And cool. it blew them away because if somebody, if somebody, I said, take your hand off. They, the, someone said, this is what happens if you have a group and you're not all cohesive. You're not all in, you know, you don't have that harmonization, that cohesion that happens. I said, we all have to be in the same frequency, the same vibration. That's a, a cool tool. It's wow. still available, but you got to buy it outside yeah. the country. It's like, crazy yeah. anything that works they get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> so so going back to the monroe institute yep. give people a little background of you know how that led into yeah. kind of well, actually explain what that institute was sure. i think his name was bob monroe yeah. and i used yeah. to use those hemisync tracks yeah. for years what, uh, uh, and, there's a book he has it's and you probably should let him know it's my Jour Five Thousand journeys out of the, out of the body and he was the first one to, to step up and say, hey, there's something else when you leave your physical form. What do you do? Where are you going? And, the, and they have different journeys, right? I'm not an expert at it now. They have probably progressed way beyond. I haven't, we sold that property in uh, 2002 when I sold my company because it was also our warehouse that held all of our, we used to have to have cassettes and <laughs> you know CDs yeah. and things like that. And, but up to that point, you could go there and they actually, it's a, it's a unique seminar. You go there, you take naps with the hemisync, right? You all get a little bunk, but then you come and you talk about it. And the, the experience is everybody has the same kind of experience. You go to the same place in the astral plane. So that got me into looking at um, Paul Twitchell. And that's another story. I was, I was, I had a, remind me of that one. I'll tell you because okay. it, I don't want to confuse the Bob Monroe, but if you read that book, he goes to some pretty spooky places. But that's not where you go when you go to the Monroe Institute, but he, he was a military guy. So I think what your mindset is, you go to the level of these, these other dimensions, whatever you're vibrating at, you go to that level, right? So mm -hmm. he would go to these warring levels. 
Oh, wow. And I didn't want to go there. I wanted, yeah. to go, I wanted to go where the spiritual beings were and, you know, where I could feel nurtured and loved and, you know, find that community there. And that was another, we'll talk about Paul Twitchell in a, in a moment. But what they did was you go to these seminars. They're still are happening right now. In fact, we're talking, we just had three talks. This is kind of good because we're bringing some of the Monroe Institute product onto BrainTap because we, we've cool. been in touch with them. We're just, they only do sound. And I said, wow, I can take those binaurals and make it bioptical. So we can, we can get the eyes because what we do is whatever's happening in the right ear happens in the left eye. We can do the same thing the Neuro Institute was doing, but we can activate 100% of the neural network. That's the difference between light and sound. But sound can do it. And so when they were teaching the remote viewing, they teach people how to remote view. with, And we did this with Silva too. So everybody is like super psychic the first time. And then their conscious mind gets in the way and they start questioning it. I mean, if you grew up in my neighborhood, you're going to go to the Porter's house and have an aura reading because everybody would, we'd have aura parties. We would have a sheet put up on the wall, put a candle behind it. And, and if you do, it's called soft eyes. And Michael and I still joke, we went to the community college there because they had a bathroom that was all mirrors. And now they have little booths you sit in. But when you're in there, if you defocus, you would see all the entities that are around, all the spiritual beings, everything were around you. So if you ever had to remember, just get in the mirror, use soft eyes, and you'll start to see things that you don't, you think you're alone. You, you even think you have ideas. The reality is <laughs> that, that we don't know. Because I, I, I remember sitting in business meetings and watching someone come over and whisper in the ear of this person and they have this great idea and they think they had it. I'm going, that wasn't your idea. That was somebody helping you out. You know, we have this whole team of people or entities or energy beings helping us out. And of course, growing up Catholic, we called them guardian angels, right? So there's different names for them. In, but what they do with Monroe Institute is they teach you how to tune your brain so you're balanced. And we know actually now through neuroscience that almost all problems we have in this world uh, with our brain start with an imbalanced brain. So the hemisync would balance the brain. Once that happens, you can then eject out of your pituitary pineal region and you go on these spiritual journeys. And like people like Dick Sutphin, who's a friend of ours as well, in, in Sutphin Research and things, they started doing out-of-body stuff and remote viewing. But I think Patrick Flanagan was the, you know, he was the main guy. And then uh, we, they also were part of the Stargate program. That's part of what they did for the military that they say they stopped, but he said they haven't. You know, they're still doing it. They just don't talk about it. But anybody- This is, this is where a, a trained soldier- goes to Afghanistan remotely and goes, Bin Laden's in that cave kind of thing, right? Yes. I mean, I'm using right. just a, a crude exactly. example. But. Right. What, what the, the thing is that we see only the particles of reality. We don't see the waves because they're infinite. But when you go into this whole brain state and you go into this space between what is and what isn't, I call it the quantum, the quantum gap. When you get into the quantum gap, you basically were not People think they're here. I remember the Maharishi uh, and even Swami Rama did this when they were doing research with him for neurofeedback. They're doing his brain and they said, what are you looking up here for? I'm here. You know, he's not here. I mean, but everybody thinks it's up here in your brain, right? But we have brains, uh, our cells are brains. You know, everything's a br everything is, is energy. So it all has information. And so with remote viewing, if you get into that space and you you train your brain. We, what happens to most people when they meditate is they shut down the frontal cortex because this frontal lobe, because what we're taught under stress, what do we do? We close our eyes. We, if we're watching a scary movie, we close. Our, it's just a movie. But what, what that does, it shuts off this capacity to think. And then we go into our limbic brain and then, we're, then, then we don't even have emotions really. We're just kind of reacting to things that we're not going to be remote viewing at that point. But if we can learn to meditate, and that's where breath work comes in too, because they would teach some breath work to do that, because we have to oxygenate. Our brain uses so much energy. And most people think of meditation, they go, I don't get any results from meditating. All I do is fall asleep. Well, that's because you're not meditating. You're falling asleep. <laughs> you know, you got to stay between. You. And what they would do in their binaurals is try to keep you an alpha. An alpha is a timeless place that you go to. But also, when you're an alpha, we now know, they didn't know this back in back even in 2000 that when you're an alpha you have a gamma burst which means you have this burst of gamma energy just like they now know that when you're sitting in meditation with gratitude and love you start generating these gamma brain waves 
that breaks down amyloid plaque and gets your brain to work better. But you also have a delta burst. And that delta burst means that your brain is now detoxing. It has to make room for this new energy. So it displaces the toxins so your brain can operate at its highest level. So the more you can stay in, in Silva, we called it level. In the Moreau Institute, they just called it binaural beats, but they were going to that same level. Now we also know, because nobody could go to theta, very few people. I mean, you have to be a real meditator, somebody who's really perfected it. And by the way, I've, I've actually measured the brains of gurus in India, and some of them don't even have highly efficient brains. I mean, I would say most of them. They just, you know, you can tell who the pretenders are and, and who the real people are by seeing how their brain operates. Were, are some of them uh, able to drop into theta? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of them are able to go. I mean, we, some of them you say, go to this brainwave. They go there. Go to that brainwave. Go oh, there. wow. They, they don't need, they don't need a brain tap to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. just, they just do it. But others, it's like their brain is really hurting. Uh, you know, they, they suffer the same thing that happens in to everybody else. Stress eating too many lentils. Yeah. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, in the process of what, what they do with Moron students, they get you into the state. Once you're in the state, I tell people, it's like, if you're looking for the statue of Liberty in LA, I don't care how determined you are, how motivated you are, how positive you are. You're never going to see the Statue of Liberty. You need to get to New York. So you got to get to the right state first. So they teach you to get into that state. Once you're in that state, I tell people, we can get you the state that a guru goes to. And I'll give you an example since you're into psilocybin and things like that. A study we're doing with a group in Dallas, Dr. Rosenthal, we were doing a PSD, PTSD study there. And they want to do with the psilocybin. They said, what do you think about a psilocybin and brain tap? I said, well, you might not need brain tap if you're using a psilocybin, but let's see what happens. Because I know when you're doing a psilocybin, you're, you're activating gamma. Because we've, we've measured that, right? And I said, well, he said, we have some people in the study that don't want to do a psilocybin because they're addicts and they're afraid they're going to get addicted or whatever, even though that's never been kind of proven out. You don't really get addicted to it. But if they're afraid of it, they're going to, whatever they think about, they're going to bring about, right? So we said, okay. I said, take give me 10 scans of the brains of people while they're on a psilocybin. So I made sessions in brain tap. They're the gamma sessions we have. And we're getting people having a psilocybin trips digitally. So they don't have to take the drug. They just have to get into that state. Now, what they do there is up to them. Now, the awareness, now they get there. What do you do? It's kind of like if you went with me to Hawaii, I could, I could look at the map and take you to places. But what if we went and found a Huna that knew all the places? He could take us everywhere. So we need to find somebody who's a guide who can, who can take us to those places. So think in terms of getting into that state. A lot of people want to get there, but they don't, they don't want to have the patience or the practice to get into that state. But they think, we were just talking about this on the way over. I, I, I jokingly, I used to have a slide I would show. It was, you know, carnation chocolate milk, but I had it changed to a little Buddha and it said two scoops to instant enlightenment, instant Buddha. <laughs> you know, that's what people want. They want to get up in the morning, tear their milk, stir their, their oh, I'm Buddha. You know, that doesn't yeah. happen. I mean, the reality yeah. is we can't be more than we are, but we can realize more than we are because we are limited beliefs that we've been fed. So that's part of the, part of the mission, I think, of, of uh, Monroe Institute was they were the first one on the scene. The, the new, they were the, they're the big granddad that basically they didn't evolve. That's why nobody hears about them now because they, they thought sound, sound, sound. But in 86, light came about for the masses, I should say, because it, it had been about, around since 1930s, but we couldn't afford it. They didn't have a way to, just, to deploy photobiomodulation at that point. So that's when the uh, LED chip started really coming out and do, doing its thing. Wow, fascinating. Have you ever had any remote viewing sessions where you were your consciousness and awareness was definitely somewhere else and and had that verified in any way? The I've never personally had it verified uh, like that, but we've uh, I have a friend that I'll, that uh, his name is Gil Gilly, and he was he was brought up with a guy named Ernest Holmes. If you've ever heard of Church of Religious Science, and uh, he was one of my mentors and. He, uh, we had an uncle that we couldn't get him to stop drinking. He just, he said, just a minute. He says, go just about that fast. He says, go out to the, this was in Phoenix. He says, go out into the, the, the uh, little alley behind the house, go down three garbage cans. His bottle is right there. Because we couldn't figure out where he was getting the alcohol from. We went down there. There it was. He went right there. And this guy, uh, this guy was so unique that uh, he could read your mind. I had a cousin that said, no way. I said, well, you come with me. You talk to Gilly. And he 
freaked her out. She left because everything she was thinking, he just would tell her, boom, boom, boom. And uh, he was one of the, he's the guy that told me about this technology, actually. The, the first light and sound was because he told me, uh, Patrick, you need to go to my place. He was a medalist at the Sahara, as, but he was actually a, a, a doctor of uh, natural medicine. But his side job was being a medalist because he was this, he said, everybody thinks he's something unique, but he's been tested and he's normal. You know, everybody else is, is abnormal. We're all supposed to be doing this. And he told me I would meet this woman. Her name is Linnea at the show. And she's going to teach me about this technology that's going to change the world. And I didn't even have enough money to get there. And so he gives me his black card key to the Sarah. I drive up there. I'm walking between events. And this woman stops me and says, Hey, I want to show you this. You know how the people are at booths. They try to grab you. And I said, I'm, I'll be back. I want to go hear this lecture. And she says, my name's Linnea. I said, screw that. I'm over here. <laughs> you know? I said, what, what do you got for me? Uh, and she says, well, we have this device. It's called a SILS, Sensory Input Learning System. It was a big box and it had two cassettes that would go into it. And you had to manually watch respiration, heart rate. It, it was only biofeedback. There was no such thing at that time as neurofeedback. That wasn't invented yet. But I laid down on the mat. She put it on me. Boom. And the most bizarre thing happened to me. I was flying through space. As real as we're sitting here. As real. I mean, I, it was a transparent spaceship. I was the captain. I knew everybody there. We're on our way to Earth. We can see it there. And I'm telling them, we're going to go to that planet. We got to do... And we're having this long conversation with my crew. And she wakes me up. And I go what are you doing? I said, I'm having this great hallucination, you know, and, and I did some pretty neat stuff in college. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this is, you know, waking up my brain like that. She said, what do you mean? I said, I was on a spaceship. She goes, really? And so, and I went back, I kept going back during that event and trying to recreate that experience. It never happened again, but I became involved. And this is how the universe works. And I like to tell people is if you're ready, remember I had no money. I said, I want one of those. They said, well, it's, it's only $10,000, <laughs> right? I said, $10,000, I can't afford that. But when I went back toward the end of the show, she's crying, Lene's crying, Larry's all distraught. And I said, hey, what's going on, guys? And they said, Dr. Robinson died. He's the guy who invented the sills. And I said, oh man, that's a bummer. I said, what are you guys going to do? We, we don't know what we're going to do. We, we have family in Scottsdale. We're going to go there. I said, I have an office in Scottsdale. Why don't you come use my space? I have empty rooms I'm not using. I, I have my undergraduate is in electronics. I said, I'll help you re-engineer this, thinking we could take a $10,000 machine and maybe I could make one and get it for free or something like that. So they brought the machine, put it in my office. I got to use it every day. Didn't have to pay for it. And one thing led to another. We're trying to create, recreate this device that he, and by the way, he didn't let anybody know how to build it what it was involved with it. It was like oh, so wow. sneaky. Be there was a guy named Dr. So there were no blueprints or yes, patents or anything? Nothing. Oh, man. Nothing. They, they only made eight of them. So it wasn't like it wasn't out there. Huh. But before they came to my office, we arranged this. Jerry, that same guy that got me into the Arizona Health Council, calls me and he says, Patrick, I got to introduce you to some people. Remember, I just met him a week and a half earlier in Vegas. I'm now in Phoenix. This is before cell phones. They're supposed to call me. They haven't called me. I haven't talked to them. I'm like, man, how am I going to get a hold of these people? It's not like today you can go on social media and track down your high school sweetheart. you know. And so the universe, though, introduced them to Jerry. Jerry said, I'm going to bring them by your office. And her name is Linnea Reed. And I said, damn, I know her. I met her two weeks ago. She's supposed to be getting with me. She said, she told me that she met somebody who was, had a clinic in Scottsdale. She was supposed to get a hold of them, but she lost the number. Well. So the universe was going to make sure I met these people. Now, when Gilly told me that, that I was going to help invent this machine, I had no idea. I'm like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? But when we had it, he, so while, while we're building this, I'll make it a short story. So people, it's in a book that actually I did with Stephen E., The Miracle Story. But the, uh, what happened was we were making our prototypes and we couldn't get it to work. We had to hire another engineer. I kind of oversold myself, you know, to, to, to help <laughs> us do it. I knew what I wanted to do, but, you know, the science was ahead of my experience. But that never stops me. You know, you go find somebody who has that experience. And they built a little prototype. Everything we built, the first 2,000 were made from Radio Shack. 
So we made them in the back office and soldering irons. And we bought a, we had an EEPROM chip maker. Those just came out, by the way, programmable chips. It was this, it was giant. You know, it wasn't like we have today. And so what they did was I started working with people and I started to realize what the patterns were and how the brain responded. There was no neurofeedback. So we didn't know if the brain was really doing that. But what we noticed was the breathing would slow down. We could see the, the parasympathetic release. I mean, the sympathetic release, the parasympathetics go up. And so we're measuring this and I created 10 different series and we, we programmed that into a chip so nobody had to sit there and do it. And I said, let's test it and see what happens. I take it to my clinic. I hook it up through all my equipment. I said, you know what? I built that 10,000. I said, come to come over here to this room because my office was up front. I said, this is where I'm seeing people. I said, look, and I made a sales machine. They go, what do you mean? I said, I took that little prototype. I hooked it up to this cassette player, that's thing. And I said, look, they go, you made a sales machine. I said, that's right. I said, can we keep making these? They said, oh yeah, we can make those. I said, well, I have some friends we can give them to. And they said, do you, do you think you could sell those? And I said, I would love to sell them. I said, I, my credit card, I, cause I paid for the $2,000 to get all the parts from Radio Shack on my <laughs> credit card. And I said, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you make 10 of them? I'll sell them. We'll see how people like them. I sold them within a week. Before we knew it, we're at the CS show. Fast forward three years, we're at the CS show getting an award for the best new gadget of the year. You know, and this is before cell phones, before CDs, before anything. And we're like a, an alien. I remember we were on the front cover of the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. It used to be there, not in, in Vegas. And we were on the front cover. We had a, a line of about 2,000 people waiting. That's why we got on the, and the Rolling Stones were playing behind us. These people are all passed <laughs> out, you know, and we never made it. But one of the big attractors to the booth was we had Jordy LaForge's. We had like a Jordy LaForge. Uh, headband saying that that was going to be the future. That's what, that's what I really wanted to create it was something like you'd put on this Jordy LaForge kind of thing and go into these altered states. And that's really what started the journey. And what about this Paul guy? Uh, you mentioned earlier, I forget the last oh, name. Oh, Paul Twitchell. Yeah. yeah. Twitchell. Yeah. He's, he wrote a book called in my soul, I'm free. So one thing led to another, this was before any light and sound machines or anything like that, but I was doing my research and I should even back up a little bit further so people understand why I got on this bizarre path. In 1984, I had a bisulfite poisoning from a factory accident that I was in. And I was in the hospital and they, I was getting worse, getting worse. It, I looked like I had Parkinson's. I could not talk. I could barely walk. I, and they basically, and I was at that Seventh-day Adventist hospital because I was vegetarian. And then somebody said I was probably, I shouldn't have been there because I was probably detoxing. So it was really, but I could, when I, if you were sitting with me at that time, I couldn't tell you what was going on, but I could see your transfiguration. You would be changing into all the different people you've ever been while I'm sitting there. And I was freaking out. I thought I was going crazy, you know, like wild craziness. And my sister said, um, she came to visit me at the hospital and the next day they were going to do a full blood transfusion, try to figure, cause there's something in my bloodstream. They figured it was the bisulfites from the metering pump that kind of blew up in my face and the, it did blow up in my face, I should say, but the, in, so I breathed it in and my lungs, I had a, what they call chemical pneumonia. So yeah, my lungs actually sounded like Reynolds wrap in. Um, so while I'm sitting there in the, in the hospital bed, she says, I'm going to send my guides to heal you tonight. I'm thinking, I can't say anything. But then that night, I'm laying in bed, and I mean, I can't explain it, but there was a golden being that came into my room. And that golden being said, go to sleep. And before that, I could not sleep. I, my body was so toxic, so polluted. I would lay down. I would do everything. I just could not sleep. And so, but I freaked out when this thing came into my room. I had sleep paralysis. I couldn't move while he was in the room or she was in the room. I couldn't tell. It was a big, giant golden being. And after they left, and I don't know how much time they were there. It's like a timeless thing. I ran out. This is, remember, this is a long time ago. There weren't phones in the room. So I had to go out to the hallway and I called my sister. She said, Patrick, you're talking. I could not talk before that. I was, I just couldn't get, I knew what I was thinking, but I couldn't get my body to do it. And she said, well, what did they say? And I said, because I told her, Shelly, don't ever send your guys to see me. It scared the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. and, she, and she said, well, what did they say? And I said, they just said, go to sleep. She said, well, go to sleep. I said, well, I can't go to sleep. I've been trying for the last two weeks. They even give me sleep, the hardest narcotics to go to sleep. It wouldn't put me out. And she said, just go to sleep. They told you to go to sleep. I went to sleep. They came in at 1130 the next morning to wake me up to have this blood transfusion. I slept through the night first time. And the doctor said, whoa, let's check his blood. Let's see what's happening. Nothing in my blood. They kept me in the hospital for over two months 
to figure out how they healed me. Now, I never told them that a golden being came in, <laughs> came in but one thing, one thing they did tell me was I was too happy. Could you imagine that? Being told by your doctor, you're too happy. They thought I was depressed. That's what my problem was. Now I'm too happy. I was happy to be alive. I mean, and still to this day, I wake up every morning and go, wow, I get to do another day here because I felt like I was dying you know, for the, for the three weeks I had that pollution in my body. And they checked me out, nothing in my bloodstream. They couldn't figure it out. So they said, we need to give you lithium. This is before they knew what lithium even did. I was one of their guinea pigs. So Michael, he brought me the book by Maxwell Maltz, Psycho-Cybernetics. Oh yeah, I love that book. And he said, read this book, don't take that damn pill. So they wanted me to take the pill. I put it under my tongue. They'd walk out, I'd spit it out. But the weirdest thing was after two weeks, they said, I, I leveled out my lithium. Because what I started doing was holding it in my hand, going to level, which we learned in Silva, I said, whatever this lithium is supposed to do for my brain, my brain can do it because it's just a reaction to it. That's what I learned with the, in the book, you know, the, right, the cycle. Right. So, and like, then he, the, like the happy device, yeah, the yes. non-covalent bond molecules, right? Yep. Interesting. So I started doing that for myself. And they said, my lithium, they go, we got the right amount of dose for you. We're going to monitor you for a month. And if it works, and they, they actually gave me a year off of my job, which I'd never go back to. It was a, a really polluted environment. It was a, a plating company that made the grills. It was really, now that I think about it, I was there to see how greed destroys our planet because they were just, the guy didn't care. He was like killing really beautiful land in Michigan, you know, where I was working because, and he would just, it was just terrible. But, you know, he didn't care. Greed, he just wanted to make money, you know, and, and create this. So then as, as I was doing that, I went, I went out because I'm thinking, who is this golden being? What is this? I was brought up Catholic. I only knew that there was Jesus. And I, and I still think Jesus was a real master, but I learned there are a lot of others. I'm like, what? I didn't learn that. Nobody, I mean, I grew up in a town that was so Catholic that I didn't even know there was another religion. I, I, you know, it, it <laughs> seriously? Was, seriously. I mean, when I, after this happened, I go, there's another religion? I mean, we thought born again Christians were like, why did, why did they leave the church? What's going on? This is weird, you know? And now I know, I tell people I've kind of graduated, although I, I think all religions are good. It's the people in them that, that make them negative because people are going there for some spiritual nutrients, right? But that's, so I went on a mission. So I was reading a book. Uh, there's two books that actually changed my life. One was My Life Preceding 5,000 Burials by Hamid Bey. If you haven't read that one, whoosh, most people know about Parahansi Gonanda, right? Parahansi Gonanda got people to his talks because Hamid Bey would put himself into a state of abeyance. He would be pronounced dead. They would bury him 5,000 times while Parahansi Gonanda gave a lecture. Then after the lecture, they would unbury Hamid Bey. They would pronounce, he's dead. And he'd bring himself back to life. He was a six ring Egyptian master. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. But he died in 1976. He actually died when he came over because he was trained. Actually, they, in the book, he'll tell you he was, he was picked out of all the kids in India, in Egypt, because they knew in the future, there was going to be somebody, uh, the, the magician Houdini was going to say he could mimic anything spiritually, right? Anything, anything you do spiritually, he could mimic with magic, right? That was his thing. When he, they, when he arrived in New York the same day that ha, ha, uh, Houdini died. So they say it was an energy clash because he, he prepared his whole life to come over here and challenge Houdini that he, Houdini couldn't do those things. And Houdini was doing it with magic. Hamid Bey was doing it with spiritual nature or whatever he was doing. Mm -hmm. So, I knew Parahansa was there. So that's why I moved to, to Phoenix. I, I saw, actually, I moved to Sedona because I saw a brochure of Sedona. I went, oh my God, that's where I'm supposed to live. This is amazing. But when I, coming from Michigan, I drove to Sedona. It's beautiful. I went there a lot and used to be on a camp on Bell Rock and the vortexes and that. But um, when I went there, I go, how do you get a job here? How do you, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I wondered what, what, the same thing recently. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, well, how do you make a living here? You know? Yeah. So I kept going down to Phoenix and that's when I started to research all these other kind of spiritual awakenings and, and just stayed involved with the technology because again, you want to be in that state. And for me, what, what helped me was going into that meditative state. So I never missed a day of doing, I still do other meditations too, even though I own the brain tap, I, I do other meditations because I think you've got to keep your body tuned you know, and, and keep receptive. And so I was always looking for what's the next thing. So when people say, why is he talking about Neuro Institute or 
Paul Twitchell. He wrote the book, In My Soul, I'm Free. And they talked about these spiritual places. And the reason I went to him was I, had a, I, was, I was doing a Jyoti meditation, which, by the way, is another reason why we do the lights in the eyes. If you've, if you, a Jyoti meditation, for those that haven't researched that, that's a candle that you look at. It's just far enough when you breathe, you kind of make it shimmer. And, and you look at it and you're doing this gazing. So you're getting the light in your eyes and it's actually changing your brain frequency. We know now it's 10 hertz frequency. A, can, a oh, fire, really? fire burns at 10 hertz frequency. So, really? Wow, so, that's interesting. So when, you and, when you're sitting with Allison near the fire and you're having a great time, you're both swimming in these acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters. So you're in the right state to be in love Wow! because the fire is going. So the fire adds to the environment, right? It, our brain is always matching its environment. So, in the, so I'm doing this Jyoti meditation. And my parents, which I moved to Phoenix first, then my parents followed me. My whole family followed me. I was trying to, I had to get out of Michigan because my friends, when they found out what happened to me, they would show up with a joint or with some beers, something going, because I used to own a house with seven guys. They would rent rooms for me. First thing I did was tell them, you got to move out. I'm, that's not Patrick anymore. I did, in fact, they, I was known as Pat then. When somebody says, why do you go by Patrick? I said, Pat was the guy. Pat was the guy that partied, didn't give a shit about anybody and was just in it for himself. And, you know, and, I, and I've always had a knack for making money. You know, I've always just, and now I know through numerology, it's because I'm missing an eight, but I'm, my destiny, I'm an eight, one, eight, eight. So my destiny is to make money, but I, I, you know, I don't, I'm missing it. So my karma is to make money. You know, it's one of those weird things when, when somebody tells me they can't make money, I'm going, making money is the easiest thing. You know, that it's, it's helping people, you know, that it's difficult or staying. My problem is keeping the money because I give it away and do different things with it. But in the, in the process of doing all this, the, the experience with, with Paul Twitchell was I wanted to, I wanted to go to the spiritual planes. And I, I still remember, because I also joined Nichiren Daishon Buddhism, because I'm thinking, I want enlightenment. I'm going to go where, I'm going to go do Buddha. You know, this is the 72, what is it? The 72 Buddha or whatever. It was Nichiren Daishon. So you're chanting, Nam Yo Ren Geki Yo Ren Geki. And one day I'm in the chants and somebody's, they go, what are you chanting for? And somebody says, I'm chanting for a car. I'm chanting for a, a relationship. I'm chanting, I'm going, what? I'm in my brain. I'm going, what? You can go buy those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, why would you chant for those? You know, it's like, do the work and you get the reward. You know, the, I want to chant for something you don't get here. Like, I want to, I want to have, I didn't know at the time, love. You know, I didn't know what I was missing because I never had it. You know, I, I didn't have that feeling of acceptance and love. We came from a big family, but we didn't hug. We were the we were the family that made fun of the family that hugged in church because we were we were Irish Catholic. You know, you don't do that. You know, you're tough. You don't cry. You know, and all those kind of things. You don't show emotion, and so it took a lot to break that down. But I got out of Nichiren Daishon Buddhism because of something that happened when I got my Gahanzan, which is you know after you've done it for a certain level and you you can chant all these different things. They they will give you your life mission on a piece of paper that you chant the rest of your life. And I researched it and basically I'm chanting for my crops to grow my, you know, it's basically, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, this isn't spiritual. What are we doing? It's crazy. But the thing that really shocked me was, uh, in, uh, I, I actually just told the story coincidentally this morning to the staff or the team is that, uh, cause we're talking about, you got to live what you preach, right? You, you got to be the person that you want to be. And I, I was, there was a thousand people getting their Gohanzans that day. It was an awesome ceremony. You know, you're sitting there and it's, the energy's up, everybody's chanting and it's, it's awesome. And when they're walking back, his, his handler, this was the, the, the monk from Japan. He stops by my, my booth there. I mean, my, uh, where I was sitting in the, in the uh, temple and he says, he wants to talk to you. So I get to go back with six other people and have a private meeting with him just out of the blue. I don't know how that happened. You know, it's one of those things the universe just brings it to you. I'm sitting there. We're having a great conversation. And the guy reaches over and smokes a cigarette, the, the monk. And I guess he could see my face, you know? And, and so his, his handler said, he wants to know what's wrong. And I said, well, I can help him with that. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, if he's addicted to cigarettes, I can help him get rid of that. And he goes, he's not addicted to it. He said that when his master died, his master used to every night go out and have one cigarette and watch the sun sunset. Now we know nicotine's okay, right? I mean, there's some parts of nicotine, right? With the biohacking, they talk about it. But back then I'm thinking, 
one cigarette. Okay. That's fine. You know, you have one cigarette. That's not going to hurt you. It's like a peace pipe or something. You know, he's out there doing it and hopefully he was using, you know, the non-chemical cigarettes and yeah, things like yeah. that. And then, but he proceeded to chain smoke. And I think it was the universe telling me, you're not supposed to be a Nichiren Daishon Buddhist. You're just supposed to go there and learn that chanting runs energy through your body. Because I could, I would just be vibrating. I mean, I could have easily fallen in love. I mean, I could easily go to a temple and just be there. You know, just let me stay there and chant and do all those things. But that's not my mission, right? I'm not supposed to just go do that. So I did that with s- several different disciplines. And something would always, even um, Paul Twitchell stuff, and there's a lot of, you can chant the you, and I still do that. That's how you go out of the body. So it's, it's, a, it's another technique to remote view. And so when you're chanting a you, which is, very simple, but it's hard to perfect. You basically can go to these spiritual planes and have these talks. But what happened with me in, in Phoenix when I was doing that Jyoti meditation was in the middle of it, I'm in this deep state of alpha or whatever I was in. And my brother comes up and he says, dinner's ready, slam. He just opens the door while I'm meditating, <laughs> slams the door. Well, next thing I know, I'm walking through the kitchen with, a, with who I now know as Rebus Torres. But I didn't know Rebus Torres at the time. And he says to me, that's your father. His name's Michael. That's your mother. Her name's Nancy. That's your brother. His name's Michael. Everybody pointing out everything. He says, that's the dinner you didn't eat because you've been with me for the last two hours. And then I could see through the house all the way to where my body was sitting. He says, that's your body. You've got to go back now. Boom. I was back. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell just happened to me? What? <laughs> and and. I didn't know who it was, right? I'm walking through a bookstore in Phoenix and there's a, on the cover, there's a Rebus Torres, a picture of him that Paul Twitchell had painted. And I asked the book person, I said, who is that person? They said, no, oh, that's Rebus Torres. I said, I got to get that book and read about it. And then, so then I could go visit Rebus Torres and just have conversations with him by going to this, this spiritual place, which I didn't know about until that happened. So that's what I'm talking about. I put all these kind of, these stories are all written in, in the book that I'll soon publish. My, my publisher at the time said, I, I shouldn't, this was back in the 80s. So, you know, they, they said, they go, do you want to be taken seriously? Now we know, I mean, when, when like Allison's being voted the shaman, you know, like she's the shaman of the year and all that. Now, when people like that are accepting it, back in the 80s, only 5% of the population would even talk to you about meditation. Yeah. So yeah. our world has really changed and evolved over time. Thank God, because yeah. I don't, I was weird my whole life too. <laughs> it's like finally, finally the world seems to be kind of catching up. Uh, I want to remind everyone, cause you just dropped so many books, so many different, you know, figures. They can go to lukestory.com slash brain tap for the show notes for this episode. My team will do the best to link out to all your books and all these things mentioned. Cause so I get questions after we publish these, <laughs> like, what, what was that thing he said? I'm like, it's in the show notes mm-hmm. or at least we do our best. So, um, God, there's so many directions to go here. How does hypnosis uh, come into your journey and and how does that relate to brain tap? Because mm-hmm. often when I'm listening to the brain tap tracks, and since you've been in town, I'm like, yeah. oh, I gotta get back on that, <laughs> even though I don't I don't have the full headset with the lights right now. I just Josh said, just listen to the tracks, you know, right. when you're working. So sometimes I'll work and just put on the alpha wave mm-hmm. tracks. Uh, sometimes in the morning I'll do the different manifestations, but the ones that are your voice seem to definitely have an element of hypnosis to them. And often there's a dual voice Mm -hmm. where, you know, there's the main track. And then over here in the right ear, you're like, and you don't need to worry about remembering any of this. (laughs) It's getting it. You know, it's it's really cool. Right. I love them. So I'm, you know, I don't even know this to be true, but is, is hypnosis part of this? Cause it's been something I've experimented with and I think uh, like like Richard Bandler says, everything is hypnosis or nothing is hypnosis. So even down to the clothes we put on today, we thought, how am I going to show up today? We have this ideal, right? And we, so we dress our, we're, it's like Halloween every morning. We, we dress up and I remember going to a Halloween party. They said, what are you going as? I'm going as a hypnotist, you know, because <laughs> I, I had my office clothes on, right? right? And hypnosis plays a big role because, but it's not the hypnosis people think about. People think of hypnosis like the state shows, and I've done a lot of those. I mean, that's what I did with Gilly. I was his, I was his warm-up act in Vegas where I would, but mine was called the Mystical Mind Tour. I did all spiritual things during my state show. People that didn't think they were psychic were giving readings, and we would have people see, see into their wallets and all sorts of bizarre, and everybody could do it. 
because so you weren't having someone act like a monkey or, you know, no. like I remember on a cruise ship, there was a hypnosis show and I, it, it seemed real, but he would have someone come up on stage and do something ridiculous and then pull them out of it. And they were like, what? I didn't yeah. do that. My, my dad, my dad studied hypnosis. I have too. My franchise used a lot of hypnosis and NLP as we learned it. And, um, it's powerful, but the, the problem with hypnosis is it had, you have to believe. You know, you have to suspend somebody's disbelief in order to get them to believe what you're saying. And the problem is you can't get everybody into that state because they're critical mind. Now, I, I believe everyone can benefit from hypnosis, no question. And it's a powerful technology. But the problem is that people, they get, they, they get in the way of it working. But the language patterns, I studied with Ericksonian hypnosis first. Uh, I had an office in Scottsdale, remember? So Milton Erickson was right there. So Jeffrey Zeig and those, those folks. So if, I, I always figured, my dad was really big at this. He said, everybody talks about the expense of an education, but nobody talks about the cost of ignorance. Oh, so wow. so uh, he told me, he said, and I still take training. I mean, even this weekend, we, I, we learned a lot, right? I mean, yeah. the modern Nirvana then, if you didn't go, you missed it. You know, it was, it was incredible. And like what Deepak dropped on us, I mean, that was awesome because that's like a whole different story than I've heard him tell before. And it was, it was really cool. And so you have to have that child mind. And so hypnosis was really good. And, but when I got into NLP, you can use the, hip, the language patterns, but they gave it formation, let's say, because now it was structured. Like the only reason I could have a franchise was I could record the bass, like I could record the bass drum. And then my therapist could, could do the interaction, like the coaches. Now they call them coaches. Back then, that wasn't a word that, you know, back in that time when you thought about coaches, thought about football and that. But hypnosis plays a big role because of language. We need to get people to relax and slow down and accept the messages. So there's a, when people listen to it, they'll hear that dual voice you're talking about. Those are really, they're, I think of affirmations are good. But when you think of an affirmation, it's like something told to you. But what if you could say, instead of saying, I am rich, that's an affirmation, right? What if you heard, what if you were rich? What would you see here and experience? That's a whole different thing for your brain because the brain then can act on that. So if we can get those neurons wiring and firing around that concept, now unseen forces go to work for you, proving you right. The other is just, somebody says, I'm rich. And then they go, oh, but I'm not rich. I, I, I have credit card debt and, and I'm not able to... Uh, maybe go out to a dinner outside of the home. You understand all yeah. that self talk, but it, so it's all about what, where, when, how we don't have to worry about the why most people get, they get too involved with why they're doing something or, you know, why they're in trouble. Like you say, well, what's happening? Why aren't you successful? Then they start telling you all the excuses, but what if you were successful? What would you do? What would you do today? What if you were just put on the planet right now, right this very moment, and we predicted for you your past, and we predicted for you a future, but you get to change it because this is a new day. There's never been a day like today. There's never been an experience like now. So part of what we do is we have to dehypnotize. Um, in fact, we're here at the, at, the, at the ranch, right? The Music Hill Ranch. And Rod uh, Harrison, who's an expert at NLP and things like that, he probably said it best. He said, you know, what, what happens with people is they have all this uncertainty, right? And this uncertainty causes them to seek out certainty. But what they really find is inadequacy. But then they don't want to do the activation. So a lot of times with hypnosis, people would come and say, I want this change. I want to be a non-smoker. No, you don't. You want to have a lifestyle that is tobacco-free. You don't want to be a non-smoker. You want the same results that you get from the cigarette from something else. If you don't find it, you're going to keep smoking because that's your best choice right now. We always make the number one best choice. Not the best choice for us, but the best choice at that moment, given all the parameters that are there. We, so we, we can go back in time and make all the changes, right? If, if we had the looking glass, like, you know, we could, we could say, wow, go back. So what we believe is you're already in the future. You've already done this. We know that. Because we have the world's greatest biocomputer, a hundred billion neurobit processor, and each one of those neurons is more powerful than a Cray computer. So imagine the predictability our brain has. And when Deepak Chopra says 97% of what you're going to do tomorrow, we know about today, what are you pretending not to know? So when people get up and they have the same, you know, the, the old bumper sticker that said SSDD, same shit, different day, <laughs> you know, it's like you created the shit, change it, change something. You know, 
And so with hypnosis, we found that was a good start. NLP was an even better start. So in my book, I have a book called Discover the Language of the Mind for those that really want to learn how we put it together. And what I did differently than other therapists is I didn't go out to train a bunch of therapists. In fact, most of the people that took NLP training with me, they wanted to be Tony Robbins, right? They, and I think he's great, but there's only one Tony Robbins. I don't care how much you train, how much you do. He's got his, his genius. You got to find your genius. So what I decided was I'm going to go out to the masses. I don't want to go to, tra- I mean, of course, I trained a lot of people over the years and I'm involved with Quantum University where they take my training online. But the, the reality is that I want to help people find their own genius. Because if I do that, that's, that's, a, that's something I can live with. I can help millions and thousands of people instead of just one person. And so it's, the technology is something that we need to teach them something that will keep teaching them. So I call them uh, the, like the thoughts that think I'm, keep on thinking. That's those voice, the voice that goes back. So now when they're listening, somebody goes, what voice should I listen to? Neither. Because we're not talking to you anyway. The you that shows up to listen to it has to call on the real you to listen. Because if you could make the change, you already did it. You know, I always tell people, your best thinking brought you here. But your mm-hmm. best thinking is going to get you out of here. You know, we need to upgrade your thinking, right? So that's where, that's where the dual voice comes. And so think about it. When, when you're sitting in a room, like if you went out to a restaurant recently, and you're sitting there talking, and there's millions of noises going on around you, right? Your ears are taking in 25,000 pieces of information. What are you really listening to? Mostly what you're looking at. Because that's the way our primitive brain works. And, we're, but we're, we're hearing 25,000 pieces, but we're only acting on 40 of them. What are we missing in reality? We're not even seeing one, two, one to 2% of reality. Even as beautiful as that sunrise and sunset is, we're only seeing one or 2% of reality. They say that what, what Jesus saw in 2000 years ago is different than what we see because there's more light available to us. There's more colors. There's the color spectrum's different. There's new colors coming all the time. And neuroscience is now proving that. So we're actually opening up our perceptual filters. And 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 of course, you can do that through psilocybin and other plant-based medicines that help us to open up those filters. We're just seeing what's already there. It's just right there. Just like I was talking about seeing auras and seeing your guides and things. They're here right now. They're with us. And they're probably laughing going, oh, you found out. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so. Wow, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, I've had the sense in deep, meditative experiences or plant medicine or psychedelic experiences that that this narrow bandwidth of our awareness is just that right and that Mm -hmm. i don't know it's almost like a it's almost like a trick of um of our evolution that in order to just have the proprioception that we have that we're limited by our senses and that the bodies are sort of this tuning fork or projector that create a reality for us and if we get tricked thinking that that's the only reality then we tend to live in those lower states of survival and life can be much less than fun there's a lot of suffering in that limitation what's very interesting about it to me is that oftentimes really intellectually adept people are the thickest headed when it comes (laughs) to when it comes to the acknowledgement of of you know the, the the vast spectrum of of reality that is actually present that we're talking about today, right? It's it's the narrow minded skeptic, intellectual academic that thinks that all there is is what we can perceive with our senses. And I always want to just send them off to an ayahuasca retreat. Right, you know? right. Just, they, they, when you there's when, so much more there. When you start believing your own crap that it's the only thing, the real thing, this is it. You're you've already lost. We only, I mean, there's only an infinite number of possibilities from any one moment in time. And you're only living out one of them. There's an infinite number of others. So if, in, in, you know, that's kind of happening in reality right now, right? Religion, we only see things through that. And, and Deepak, I think his example he gave about the cats, because they weren't, maybe they watched the, the, some of your followers watched the Instagram live, but he was talking about how the cats that were brought up in the horizontal reality couldn't see vertical. And the cats that were brought up in the vertical reality couldn't see horizontal. Well, that's true for us. What are we, what are we, we're brought up in this reality to see things the way they are right now, what's happening in this world. What are we not seeing? Because we believe, some people want to hold on to their belief system so fully. And of course, when you believe something, you want, certainty comes from when you convince somebody else to believe what you believe. 
and then you believe somebody else and you think, oh, we have, we have this consensus. Six of my best friends believe this is the way it is. So this is the way it is. No, it's the way it is for you, but it doesn't, it's not the way it is for everyone. And like I was saying, I was brought up Catholic, so that's the way it is. I didn't know there was anything else. What are you talking about? That's just crazy talk. You, you mean people can manifest things out of thin air like Sai Baba? And I was lucky. I went to see Sai Baba many times and, and got to sit right there in the front row, touch his feet, give, get the babuti ash. Well, how does that happen? Yeah. I went, I went there once shortly before he died yeah. and he, he was quite a bit older. So he, he was, he kind of wheeled this little buggy out, you know, <laughs> took the buggy through Darshan, but I wasn't close enough to see him. Yeah. I don't even know if he did manifest anything, but yeah. I, I do have relatives that like you were just sitting right there, watched his hand be empty and watched a ring appear. My, my wife was so, like so upset. I said, Cynthia, just relax. She'd never got the, you had to pick chits to get into the front row. Right. I was there for 11 days and got 10 days on the front row. Really? Right there. What? Saw him doing everything. You hear him and he'd come up to me almost every day and I got to feel the energy. But the most amazing, one of the trips that we went there, we went there several times, but it's raining. It's a torrential downpour, like a, a what do they call it? A monsoon happening. He has to walk from his two bedroom apartment over to the Darshan Hall, right? And as he's, he comes out, they're scrambling. They're trying to get umbrellas and they're, he waves them off. The rain stopped. He walks into the, into under the roof of the Darshan Hall, does his thing, you know, talks to everybody. When he's leaving again, they're scrambling, getting the umbrella. He waves them off. It stops raining. <laughs> he walks his thing in a, in a, and I'm, they separate the men and the women, right? So I'm over here. I don't know where Cynthia is. And so we meet up afterwards. And the rain was so bad, all of the sandals got washed like almost a quarter mile. Like all the, the sandals way. outside. Yeah, yes. the, the, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, we had to go, find, you're like looking through this mud pile. Finally, I said, here, let's just go buy new sandals. They're only like three bucks over there or something like that. Yeah. And I said, did you see that? She goes, did you see that? The rain stopped when he walked. And it's like, what is going on here? You know, it's like, here's somebody who can change physical reality. Now, if I told that to some of my aunts and uncles that are still, you know, super, they be, and, and they're just so myopic. It's like, I, I remember her father and mother, because we were going over there and go, what do you go over there for? And we, we told them, well, we go over there because this is a guy that tells you not to give him money, spend it in your own community. The best thing you can do is go home and be the best person you are. Don't change your religion. Just be the best you can in that religion. He's not trying to create a following, but what did he do? You know, he created billions of people following him, but the, the, but he, he made it very clear and they go, and they go, oh, I just can't believe it. I go, so let me understand this. There could be something like that 2,000 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. But not today. That's right. I'm going, what? one time, One time deal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God, uh, gives, God gives you one shot. <laughs> but then when you research Indian philosophy, right, and the, in the history of the Hindu religion, this has happened many times. It's not like, it's not a one and done thing. I, but that, I think that's why I've been so fascinated and enamored my whole life with the Indian mystics and sages and mm -hmm. such. There's just, there's so many characters throughout yeah. history, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to be in the physical presence of a couple of them. And I, I really think it had a, a huge impact on my life. I mean, energetically and, and otherwise through the teachings. Yeah. There's something else uh, you mentioned earlier, the chanting. I know chanting for me. Uh, has been a huge part of my awakening and healing in the Kundalini Yoga tradition. And we were chatting oh, yes. the other day, and I'm like, I'm like, what has Patrick not done? It's like <laughs> everything I've ever heard of or done, you've done also, and probably more. And first, uh, well, what was your? Yeah. How did you come to find Kundalini Yoga, and well, what was your experience of that? Well, I went to to learn Kriya Yoga from Parahansi Gananda, which was really good, and I loved their chanting. Right, you go to the temple there in Phoenix on Central, and you could go there and sit in the the chanting. And somebody said, if you like the chanting here, you should go down to Yogi Bhajan's ashram down on Seventh Street. And I said, mm, that's pretty cool. I went down there, and uh, they said, and I was vegetarian, so they said, if you come in, if you come at night for five dollars, you can do yoga and have a meal. So I'm single. I'm thinking I don't have to cook. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is great. So I started doing the, and I'm I was really physically a lot more fit, which I'm committed to do i've already lost 35 pounds since covid so i committed to get back into nice. the shape that i was in before because you get lazy when you're traveling and make excuses so i decided i better start stepping up and doing that and so i started going there in the evening and they said you know you can go for free if you come at 3 30 in the morning so i started going twice a day 
then I started having these experiences because in the morning it's even better because the temple doors open up to the sun. And in Phoenix, you're always going to get a sunrise pretty much, yeah, you know, every yeah. day. So you do this two hours of Kundalini yoga with these, these Sikhs that are there. They wouldn't talk to me because I wasn't a Sikh, but you could step, you could get your little sheep rug out, do your yoga. And then at the end, they would do the meditation to the sunrise. And I started having these out of body experiences, like better than anything I've ever done, you know? And I started training my, my body that I could just do a few of the breath of fire and I could boom, get right into it. So, uh, that's one of my favorites. We just actually had a, a published article from, uh, from Ames Bhopal that I'm listed on with PubMed. We did a uh, research uh, program where we showed how pranayama using Kriya Yoga, how it affects the brain and balances the hemispheres. Oh, cool. It wasn't with BrainTap, but we yeah. used our equipment, our, our HRV equipment to test it. And uh, we had two actually breath work uh, published in PubMed this, this spring about breathing. About awesome. breath work. Are those links findable? I mean, oh, like yeah. if my team yeah. can find them. Yeah. Oh, cool. That's, that's interesting. I, yeah. I think there's one thing I really dig about all of this emerging science is that as you said earlier now there are ways to quantify mm. spiritual practices yes. and brain entrainment and the different technologies we can actually see what it's doing now it's rather than it just being limited to the subjective experiencers uh you know anecdotal account of it right i mean i love doing right. something and I put on my aura ring and I'll start a little session and I'll check my HRV. By, by yeah. the way, I found an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know what my brain waves are doing, but in one ayahuasca ceremony, I, I start right before I drank it, I started my, my aura ring <laughs> HRV and my HRV tanked for the entire time. I was like, oh, that must be pretty uh, stressful on your nervous system. Yeah. You know, I can well, see why we, the integration We only learn in important. environments of stress, right? Uh, if okay. People go, I want to learn and grow, but I want to stay in my comfort zone. That doesn't happen. You don't go to the gym and not work out your muscles. So we have spiritual muscles. We have, uh, you know, neurology. We, we need to exercise our nervous system. And these are only things that, that it's kind of like the phone. The phone is the vehicle. You're talking to the person on the other end. So somehow through quantum physics, right, we get to, we get to hear that. So, but we have to get our body in shape to do that. So mentally, we have to prepare ourselves and it's uncomfortable. Like PMF, I love PMF. I do it every morning. In fact, I travel with one because in the in the morning, that's part of my morning deal is to energize my body. Yeah, same. But but if you do an HRV after P, uh, you know PMF, a, a real I'm, I'm not talking about like there's other ones that are low low uh, wattage or whatever they call it with PMF, but the one that I hear you you got the thumping, <laughs> you know, that's gonna tear up your nervous system for a little bit. It's an exercise for the nervous system, but most people. Uh, when you hear about Fred down the street that dies of a heart attack and they go, Fred never got angry. He was such a nice guy. Why didn't, why did he die of a heart attack? Because he never got angry because he never stressed out his nervous system. We can't underperform either. The, the body will, it will atrophy. So we need to do, that's why it's so important to, to stress out the body then relax the body. The piece that most people miss is to relax the body. Like if, if you go onto our site, uh, Kansas Sporting Kansas City, actually we have a picture of their workout facility. They put in a 20 station brain tapping room after the soccer, the professional soccer team works out because they found they could reclaim 80% of the energy they had before the workout. Wow, so cool. So I, I love to do that too, actually. If I do a really hard workout, I'll do a brain tap and just 15, 20 minutes, you know, because yeah. I'd I'm just smoked if I do it right. <laughs> right. If I do like you used up I that ATP one. reserve, right? Yeah. So we need. How do we get that? Of course, we can eat food. That'll take four hours. We can drink water, or we can do breath work, which is instantaneous. Or we can do a brain tap and get light. You can go out outside and just sit in the, in the sun too. If we didn't have all the atmospheric <laughs> problems that we have, <laughs> right? Used to be you could the just people go, blocking the sun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> remain. Uh, uh, yeah, we go. <laughs> I talk about that stuff on the show. People are. I always drop the word chemtrails, chemtrails, yes. chemtrails. Right. Um, you know, and people think it's not real. I'm like, have you ever walked outside and looked at the sky? Like, I don't know, you're you're older than I yeah. am, right? I'm 50. When I was a kid, it was you'd lay on the lawn and you'd see a plane go by and there would be a condensation trail behind right. it. And you go, oh, it's just kind of, you know, hypnotic to actually to just sit there and watch it and it would dissipate. And then somewhere in the 90s, I started seeing in LA just tic-tac-toe patterns, just these huge plumes of 
whatever it is going across and it would stay all day. And next thing you know, you have a sunny day that was overcast. It's criminal. Uh, and I always like to say for the people that are, you know, environmentalists, God bless you, but why are you not paying attention to this? Right. Okay. They're I dropping uh, aluminum into our brains from the sky. Yeah, I mean, it's, and if you want to dumb down a society, that's one of the ways they did it in Germany. So they took that technology now global. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it's I, terrible. I digress. You know, I want to keep it positive, <laughs> yes. but sometimes I like to drop those in. So let's, uh, in the last few minutes we have, Patrick, let's talk about what brain tap is is actually doing you know when when you put on these um actually let me let me see that that device so for people watching the video here on on uh, i have another pair of headphones on but you can see this really sort of space age looking thing and i know people when i wear this on social media they're like what the hell is that but <laughs> on the inside there there are these led lights and then inside the actual headphones, I don't want to break them, but yeah. inside there, yeah, so. there are lights that are hitting your ears. And then, of course, there's all these different tracks that you listen to in the app. Sometimes it's it'll say alpha and it just goes like, wah, 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 or, you know, delta, yeah. theta, all the different brain waves. Gamma, you just told me. Yeah. So I didn't even know that was in the app. Yeah. So now I'm obsessed with the gamma yeah. ones. But uh, So I'll explain yeah, it. Yeah, kind of just break down, okay. you know. For, so we, we started with just retinal flashing. The books about neurophysiology and photobiomodulation now show that if you want to boost mood, retinal flashing has now been proven to boost mood. Regular, we we have studies ourselves that have done that, but now other people have have discovered that too. Your eyes are closed when you're using this, so we're just looking at photaic energy. It's a 470 nanometer light, so some people uh, don't use it at night. About 20 to 25 percent of the people can't because it it'll drive too much energy into the system. Your eyes aren't just attached to your brain. Your eyes are your brain. So it's brain matter. So when you're when you tell somebody you got beautiful eyes, you're really saying, "Hey, man, you got a beautiful brain," because that's what you're looking at. But our we're there are some people that can convert energy through their eyes. Right? What about the blue light? If you're at the spectrum of 470, I've I've wondered this, and I've used mine at night a few yeah. times. But I'm such a blue light, you know, uh, control freak that I, I often get nervous about using it because I'm like, I don't know, even though my eyes are closed, am I going to We have so many sleep studies. Melatonin? We have so many sleep studies that show we've improved coal miners sleep by 80% by using blue light at night when they sleep. Really? So blue light, we're not giving you enough blue light. This okay. is only eight LEDs. When you look at your computer screen, yeah, it's 1,208 times 470. You're talking about thousands of LED lights. Okay, This is just a very small dose. So your eyes are, you can listen. To, uh, so fact, it's not like walking into a, a room with fluorescent lights all over the ceiling no. and getting blasted with no. that really weird. And we're, we're really only looking at, this is a so little amount of energy of blue light that, but for some people, like I said, 20, 25 people, they'll just listen to the earphones, not, not the blue light. So you just, if you're somebody that anything stimulates you, like my wife can't use it at night, you know, uh, she loves it during the day and the afternoon, but if she does it at night, it's too much energy because she has blue eyes. Blue-eyed people will take in more energy oh, through the eyes. Brown-eyed people won't because we're those are designed genetically to live in country in areas of the world where oh, we have a lot more light. Interesting. So right, the, right. all those things happening. But why we use light? Um, I work with the neuro uh, neuro uh, ophthalmology research association, and your eyes actually control thirty percent of your hearing. Most people don't know that. So if you've ever been to a lecture and you couldn't hear the lecture, but then you adjusted your vision, now you could see them, you could hear them. That's because, remember, all those things happening, your brain has to, you know, when you're walking through the forest, you only want to know what you're about to step on. You don't need to know everything else. So it kind of directs your awareness. But we also know that hearing only engages about 70% of the neural networks in the brain. When we introduce light, we've now got 100% of your brain network. Not that you're using 100% of your brain's potential, but the network is activated. It comes online, and then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna actually invite cranial nerve two to what happens is our default mode network, or some people call it the reticular activating system. It goes, what the hell's going on out there? Because it's always looking around our environment. Is this safe? Is this okay? Is there danger? It, it now knows, hey, it's it's a little weird, but here, okay, we're gonna follow it. So. If you and I were on my spaceship coming toward Earth, what we talked about, and we looked at Earth, we would say when we had a frequency generator and it was measuring the Earth, it would go from 0 0.01 to 100. If we were by a volcano erupting, it'd be about 100. If we're by the ocean, it'd be about 10. If we're sitting on the mountain, it'd be 7.8. That's the Schumann frequency we hear about. So we're designed, water is 10 hertz frequency. We're designed like a hummingbird to be near the water. So what do we do? We love being by the water because it activates a part of our brain. So we seek that. 
We seek mountaintop experiences because we, it creates GABA. It, uh, not it doesn't. It tells our brain to tell our gut to create the GABA, right? So all these things are happening. So the blue light is actually being used to engage the frontal cortex. What we want to do is bring energy to that area of the brain so that you don't fall asleep. Ah, uh, okay. And then okay. So while that, you're using it. Yes. Yeah. So light is converted through the hemoglobin. You know, it absorbs the charge, circulates through the body, just like any light. Any light is going to do this. You know, we're just using tuned light. Specific. And there's red lights yes. in there too. So what we, reason we have light in the ears is uh, some of our doctors were using lasers and there's auricular points, right? Uh, Dr. Noje said there's different auricular points. You could use needles, you can use lasers, you can use seeds and everything like I was talking about iridology is also iridology. There's the ear does it, the feet do it, the palms do it. You know, our body is replicated or duplicated to get to those. So what we found was how could we use photobiomodulation? What's the best method? Well, there's a lot of great ones. Uh, this isn't the only one, but what we want to know is in the ears, we have a very special place because the ears, the blood through the body goes through the ears. It takes three to four minutes. Everywhere else in the body, it takes 45 seconds. So when you put a pad, a light pad on your body, unless you have the big wall ones that we saw at the event, which are good. I mean, we have beds that you lay in that have 12,000 of them. That's really energizing. So, but your body is going to accept those. The, it's going to circulate through the brain. Now we went into the brain because the ears control the temperature of the brain. So that's why you, when you wear a hat, you know, you're making your, the blood is warmer, your brain stays the right temperature, but that's going to be regulated through blood flow through the ears. That's part of what the ears do. So I thought, wow, what if we could use photobiomodulation there? They're already wearing the headset. So we did this with autistic children. Because they, they can't hear instructions the way that we do. And we joke, Rita Handy, who you met, uh, she helped me with the little experiment. We, we, I said, put this on the kids. These lights look, look solid. They're not. 197 times per second, they're pulsing. Oh, wow. And our brain actually knows that. Just like in the movie where um, the, uh, what is it, Dustin Hoffman, they drop the toothpicks on the ground. He says, 1,124 or whatever. They... He counted them. Our brain does the same thing. Our brain, the reason that computer screens are so damaging to us is not just the light. It's our brain is trying to figure out the patterns all the time. So it's actually doing a mathematical equation every time that screen refreshes. And now the screens are refreshing even faster. And it's is that digital. because of the flicker rate? Yes. Oh, okay. So they're using the technology that we're using here in a safe way. They're doing it, you know, it, it could be safe, but. So you're programming a deliberate flicker rate yes. to induce different states yes. and with a different goal than just something that's poorly designed. Like these lights, they call them Kino flow lights and they're fluorescent bulbs and they're designed to not flicker because you're, they're used for filming, right? Exactly. And if they flickered, if you were in slow motion, it would go wow, 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 wow. Yeah. Know? So these are flickering. Like when we, we used to have a light bed that we designed before light beds are really popular, but it, they were too expensive. They were costing us 35 to $40,000 to make in so we just kept one of them. and uh, But when we, we try to get a picture of them all the time, but, but because we could program them to, they're not just light. A lot of people just use, oh, this is 630 nanometer light. This is 810 nanometer light. Well, that's just one thing you can do with light. You can actually have it fle flicker at a frequency because there's not just light sound, there's vibration. Because everything in this universe, remember, we're looking at the particles vibrating and we give it shape and meaning. So we can also do that with light. We can give it information. And like, like sophigeal frequencies, we can give it information for harmony, for love, for peace, like a digital drug. And right now, this headset is being, the Brazilian government actually invested their own money, $250,000, to prove that brain taps a digital drug. Because our, we, we can show we upregulate 54 different neurotransmitters. Wow. So, but when the study's over, it's about halfway through the program. It's working great. They're doing blood serum draws. I actually have on my phone, they sent me the picture of the, when they're doing the draws and they said, everything's working great, just like we thought it would. And so with it, that's called Invisa in Brazil instead of the FDA, because they want, the government wants to give everybody a brain tap when they have wow. mental, mental disorders, because most of the, most of the drugs, unfortunately, and if you're taking the drugs, don't stop because I say this, just, just know, go to your doctor and get off them, but they don't work. The problem is you can't get off them. They're, they're meant for short-term use to train the brain to just like a psilocybin, you know, it's, that's why you have to do the micro dosing. But what they do is they found out when you get on those drugs, they say, these aren't addictive. But then three years later, when you try to get off them, you might as well be on heroin. Yeah. I found that yeah. to be the case. Yeah. Definitely. So, but we have our own pharmacy. 
We're only six inches away from the world's greatest pharmacy in the world. It's between our ears. It can dispense any number of 25,000 neurochemicals with a thought, but it also with an experience. So we can do ayahuasca, we can do light therapy, we can do all these, like all these neurohacking drugs, or not drugs, they're not drugs, but they're, you know, what are they called? The nootropics. Yeah, nootropics. They're basically reacting to our own brain's receptor sites. So the reason we can do things like painless surgery, like I had painless surgery with my shoulder. My dad taught me through hypnosis how to have it without any anesthetic. They cut up, they cut my shoulder open. They took a piece of my collarbone, put it over here, put a screw through it. No anesthetic. <laughs> Are you it, serious? No. Yeah, because oh my God. pain is optional here. If you wow. want to have pain, go for it. Just increase your stress, your anxiety, and your fear. You'll have a lot of pain. But if you can get into the zone, you can get into that 10 hertz frequency, 10, between 10, and 10 hertz frequency and 7.8 hertz frequency, your brain will create its own analgesia. Wow. And it'll basically, you'll be pain-free. I heard David Hawkins talking about that. He yeah. had a, he had a number of surgeries and didn't use any anesthesia. Yeah. And that, I had to believe he was in integrity and in telling the story, but oh, yeah. he described it in a similar way. Yeah, we had, I, I remember a, a person who worked for us got in a really bad burn accident all over their whole body. And that's, they have to do the scraping to get the burns off. And he couldn't do it. I said, Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hypnotize you. And all you have to do is use this keyword. The word is white, white. And if somebody has the brain tap, the similar series is in there called Pain Free. It's in the power user. I put it in there. It's a, a 13 session training to teach you how to activate your own. I've seen that in there. Yeah. That's cool. So he used that and he could, they couldn't believe it. He would sit there with a smile on his face while they were scraping his body with steel wool. Because you're not your body. You can, you can step out of it for a little bit and let them work on your body, just like you'd leave your car at the dealership, go have a coffee across the street, come back with this done, get in, <laughs> get in your car and drive away. You know, so don't identify with this body. I, I love when uh, Sai Baba actually said this. They said, Sai Baba, why don't you just live forever? He said, why don't you wear that shirt forever? I said, what do you mean? He said, this is just a shirt to me. Why would I want to wear the same shirt every day? <laughs> you know, and so people get, they start identifying with this, this body and think that that's who they are. Now we need to tune up this body because this is where we live while we're here. Just like our car. If you get the oils changed, you change the tires, you keep it maintenance. You can, you, that car will give you year after year of dependable service. But if you don't, you're going to have a breakdown. That's what most people, that's what brings them to whatever method of help. You know, I used to jokingly tell people we're a, we're a gateway drug to the self-help industry because no people only come when they're, when they're struggling. When this is for anybody who wants to optimize their brain. I mean, we have studies, one of the my one of my favorite recent studies, so people understand it's not just for pain or whatever. We uh Julia Arndt, who's a high performance uh coach with Google, we took some high performing Google execs, and Google measures everything, even keystrokes. So they know how to measure your efficiency. And she knows how to get the most out of them. So I said, what if we made a whole series based on your theories with brain tap? We did the exercise, 19% improvement in efficiency. Wow. So now everybody who does her training does it with brain tap because you can learn it on the conscious level, but how do we deliver it to the subconscious? Because that's what's running the show. Only, only 5% of your world is controlled by your conscious mind. And uh, I like to, Richard Bandler says, that everybody's running around and they're chained to the back of the bus and Freddy Krueger's driving. You know, <laughs> we, you know we, we need to kick Freddy Krueger off take the handcuffs off and drive our own bus. You know, that's yeah. the whole, that's the whole deal. But the subconscious, we have to train the subconscious, right? It's a great servant, but a terrible master. So we, we need to, we need to work with that. And that's where the hypnosis, NLP, the affirmations. Now, the other thing, if people are saying, I don't want to have anybody in my head, they're already in your head. You know, the, the, the thing is that your words, what you say to yourself, what you think about yourself, we now know can, can upregulate or downregulate 2,300 gene expressions. So who are you? You're a bundle of thoughts, you know, and, and you're not this. You know, you are something greater than this. And every once in a while, we get a glimpse of it, you know. So, but if we, if we get this body in the right place, we get in the right mindset, we tune. Think of your brain like a transmitter and receiver, because that's what it is. There's little hair follicles on the brain that they now know transmit and receive information. We have little antenna that, that get this information. So you know, like I think somebody this weekend actually said it really well. They said, you don't even know your next thought, you know, so how can you control your life? You know, we're here for the experience. 
don't try to control it. Just be, be involved in it, set out the right motion and the subconscious will take care of it. But you got to do the training. You know, you don't, if you go on a vacation without any plans, you might not get a hotel. You might not get a rental car. You might not see the things you are. So take the time to plan out that vacation. And, and for us, that vacation happens in 24 hour segments. So figure out how you're going to you know, choose your adventure as, as it were every day. That's the key. Going back to the frequencies of light, it, you know, in the app, I don't know how many, you have dozens of different programs for different goals and, and outcomes. Uh, does the frequency of the lights change based on what's in your ears? Yes. Here's what happens every session, 1,300 or more now. And I'm adding more all the time. Oh my God, there's that so many? We have Allison's on there for those that, oh, you yeah, know, that's so if right. they want to do some shaman journeys, we just got those on there and those are awesome. You know, so we, it's not just me. So if somebody's wondering, we, we have yeah. 60 other and we're looking for more. So if you have something you think we could, we could use at brain tap and they're professionally done, then we can, we can encode them to work on the brain tap network, but everyone is different. There's not one session that's the same because if we do the same, the brain will learn the pattern. And as soon as the brain learns the pattern, it says that's wallpaper. It'll be one of those other 25,000 pieces of information. That's why when people go, oh, I listen to binaurals on, on YouTube. I go, good luck with that. Because I know in the lab, if you listen to it three times in a row, the fourth time, it's not doing it. Your brain goes, oh, I know that. I got that story down. What's the next story? It's always looking for the next challenge. It's always, it says, oh, that's safe. I don't need to worry about that. And we're really training that limbic brain, not not the conscious mind. We're training. We're training the brain that controls the show. So, so with brain tap, like I, uh, there's certain favorites that I have. There's just the alpha. You know, there's maybe eight different alpha ones on there that are just the sounds. I like to listen to those when I work. There's um, some of the guided ones about manifestation. As, wealth, as long as business. you listen to the, as long as you listen to something in between. Okay. Like if you if you pick out, even if you picked out ten or fifteen that were different, rotate them. Okay. Okay. Don't listen to Got what it. I'm saying. Is don't go like today if I, if I like. Um, um, let's say you want to bust loose from the money game, which is what yeah, I love that one. So, yeah. so you listen to that, you go, wow, I really want to do that. So you listen to that every day. That's not the same. So you should then mix that up with the, the 17 sessions we have for think and grow rich or the other ones we have in the wake up audio series, which are my favorite business books. If you want to integrate yeah. those business principles, listen to those at the subconscious level, then they show up in your life in ways you can't imagine because the subconscious knows how to make them work for you. So you just got to mix them up so your brain doesn't get that pattern recognition yep. thing. Oh, you know, you just reminded me of something. You have the teachings, um, uh, one of the books of Stuart Wilde in there. Yes. I've, I rarely ever meet anyone that knows who he was. And a couple of his, back when I used to, um, I think it's one of the reasons I have a podcast is I used to buy these big cassette books, you know, of... Spiritual books, Wayne Dyer, Deepak, yeah. Stuart. We got Wild, him on there guys. too. We we have those. So the the whole thing. Was, but he was cool as hell. Yep, yep. And then he got he got pretty out there <laughs> later on. You know, went into all the alien stuff, which yeah. hey, whatever. But well, he, now the government's into it. They yeah. just released all the <laughs> yeah, all the alien stuff. So here we go. <laughs> but but there was like a period of Stuart Wilde teaching that really carried me through. Uh, really incredible. Oh, I loved stuff. it. I mean, it helped me. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was. I used teacher. to read. I used to read a book a day. Um, when I had my radio show for 12 years, I'd have guests on that would send me their books. And they were always surprised that I knew it because I read that. Like before I came here to meet Rod, I read his book and then I liked it so much I bought the audio so I could listen to it on the airplane on the way here. I do that too before yeah. interviews. Of course, yeah. I didn't read your nine books because I've heard you talk yeah. enough. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I kind of get them enough to carry a conversation. Mm -hmm. But yeah. now we're going to put them in the show notes and we're yeah. going to do that. All right, so we know that with BrainTap, we want to mix it up. We don't want to listen to the same one every yeah. day. Could you just, in closing, describe what, for those that don't know, what binaural beats are? I know they've sure. been kind of trendy in the past few years, but, right. you know, as I said, when I'm listening to my brain tab headphones, I'm just hearing wow, 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 wow. And to someone who's new to it, they'd be like, what the hell is this noise? Yeah. How, how does the sound actually work to synchronize your hemispheres or encourage different, uh, you know, so, uh, brain waves? So, what's happening is, remember, our brain is always trying to match frequencies. So it's used to having only one frequency. Like that's, that's isochronic tones. Like the planet itself is an isochronic tone generator. So it's generating this frequency and, and then there's sub frequencies, but that frequency is there. So we're, so, but if we introduce, let's say 200 Hertz frequency in one ear, 210 Hertz frequency in the other, the brain doesn't hear either of those. It hears the phantom sound of 10 Hertz. Because oh, in, so the differential the, between yeah. the two? Oh, yes. interesting. And then what the brain does is that's the one it syncs to. It says that must be it because it's it's getting this conflicting information. It's different. It's not what we we usually have in reality. 
But then what we found is not everybody can hear perfectly. So then we put a layer of isochronic tones in there too. And then to make it even better, we mix in frequencies because we want to di- hit different regions of the brain. You might find when you're listening, go, that really hit me here. There's, a, there's actually a spiritual center in the brain. So in the gamma ones, we made sure we hit that place so you could have those you know, kind of uh, experiences. Because with, now with the, even the cheapest earphones, if somebody was to use the app, even with the cheapest earphones, it will work. Back in the, back in the uh, 80s, we had to buy special earphones you know, that, that would be surround sound kind of earphones. They never had those. I mean, when those come out, that was like magic. You know, wow, these are cool. But um, there's the, the sound, when you have live sound and vibration, you make space. So when people are doing the brain tap, we create a space. Like people will have what we call island time experiences. And what that really is, is we're disengaging the nervous system. We're, re, we're, we're having you forget who you are for a while. Because if you can, you can forget who you are, you can reorganize into who you want to be. But as long as you hold on, it's like I tell people, it's the same way we capture monkeys in the wild. They go, what do you mean? I said, if I want to capture a monkey that's this tall, I know with the size of their fist, I'm going to find a, a jar with a potato in it. I'm going to have them reach their hand in it. They can't get it out because they're so stupid. They don't let go of the potato. I just reach up behind them, pop and have a hammer. They're in the Chicago Zoo tomorrow. You know, and that's what people, that potato is their belief system. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I love that analogy. You know, you just reminded me of that. When I checked into rehab when I was 26 yeah. years old, I read that or heard that yeah. somewhere. And that was, to me, the the best metaphor for addiction, right? Yeah. And it's like just not being able to let go of that thing. It's like, I knew, why won't my hand just release this thing and I could pull it out, but it just won't do right. it. It's a, it's right. a great metaphor. Because your identity metaphor. is linked to that. I'm an alcoholic yeah. or I'm a I'm this yeah. or I'm that. I'm overweight. I'm, I'm a smoker. I'm a whatever. You're none of those things. Get over yourself. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know you're, you're an infinite being with infinite possibilities there's nothing that can prevent you from doing something other than your patience of being there you know sit in the stillness and you'll figure out who you are but if you if you're so busy trying to be you'll never become you know so just let it be you know the the old song you know just just let it be and and we are you know when you look over your journey hopefully like i have so far and i i'm hopefully going to be here another 60 years you, you know they it's like, to me, every day has been exciting. To me, it feels like I'm still a teenager, you know, and there's so much that we're learning and growing and developing. And, you know, the biohacking world's actually put a magnifying glass on it because now we don't have to go to a doctor. We don't have to go to somebody in a white coat to tell us if we feel good or not. You know, we can do that for ourselves. Is there any risk or danger in, in terms of like binaural beats or any of these technologies being invasive, you know, is there any danger to kind of pushing your brain one way or another over just allowing it to naturally go where it wants to go? We did a, just to, we did a, uh, it's not like magnetic resonant therapy where you're going to get knocked out, maybe throw up, vomit, you know, and it's not a destructive force. It's an inclusive force. So this is just a gentle way to train the brain. And the nice thing is that we've shown it actually does train the brain. We just did an experiment in Newburn. It's now being done in Brazil. We took a 45-minute session, five minutes of brain tap, an HRV. Our HRV can do prolonged study, so we can hit every minute to see where the brain's at. And then we did five minutes with music. What we found was that that really did get the parasympathetics going. But then right afterwards, it went right back to their stress state. But when we took that same music with our encoding, they went down a little bit deeper. It didn't, re- it didn't totally go back for 72 hours. That's the halo effect. So we proved that with a small group of 15 people. Now we're proving it with a group of 150 people, students at a university in Brazil, because we want to show that it's not, some people go, well, I can do this with music. You can get the experience with music, but you can't get the training with music. Mm, got it. So we want to got train it. the brain. We want the, we want the brain. Uh, we always say, don't just meditate, evolve. You know, we can evolve our brains. We can get it working more. It's just, we've been locked into this belief that our brain learns a certain way, just like the educational system is from the 1800s. You know, they haven't evolved. But at Quantum University, when you go there, you're going to get a brain tap when you join. Because we know that we can teach you much faster and easier if you're relaxed than if you're stressed out, worried about if you're going to learn that information. What about stacking nootropics, microdose, anything like that? Have you, have yeah, you done any awesome. research? I yeah. think I just, well, the, yeah, that's, I'm that, always taking yeah, some kind yeah, of nootropic yeah. or something. Uh, so that's what David Rosenthal, who I would, when he called me about that, I'm thinking this is like the most straight, narrow, kind of guy you'd ever believe but plant medicines 
it's coming alive. You know, people are, I, I would have never done it if my, if, and I've not done it in the way that I will do it in the future, but uh, because I'm still trying to figure out what the safest way is for me. I've done some micro dosing and you actually helped us out. I think two years ago, after you met uh, my social media guy, Andrew, you, you brought some, we did some micro dosing. Even my wife who would never do anything like that. I said, just do this. It helps your focus. And she goes, I'll be damned, man. My, it's, it's <laughs> like her, her focus was there. She got more work done and she would never, you know, it's like she's sweet yeah. poly purebred. There's no way that she's going to do it. <laughs> but then, then you met Joquita Handy who has adaptogens like a, 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 yeah. a, a, adapt and thrive. I would when she told me she was, I'm going Joquita, <laughs> you know, it's like, but she saw it in the brains of these autistic kids. What happens this is a natural progression. The universe will always provide what's necessary for us to heal because we're not, think of yourself as an acupuncture needle. Every person on the planet is. We're feeding energy into the planet and we're taking energy from them. It's a reciprocal thing like Clint Oprah showed in Earthing. So it wants us to live and thrive and be prosperous. It doesn't want us to die. It wants us to be healthy. Awesome. Man, well, thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, where can people find you, BrainTab, all the things? Well, on, on social media at, at BrainTap Tech, and then or at Dr. Patrick Porter at Dr. Porter, uh, Dr. Patrick Porter. Um, and then, of course, they can go to uh, if they want to try out the app, they should go to your link that you're going to provide. Yeah, I will. And, I'll and put that. It. I'll put that in the show notes and in the intro and outro because I'm sure there's something there for them. Last question for you is: Who have been three teachers? I mean, you've named about a hundred of them already, <laughs> but maybe something else will come. <laughs> who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your life or your work that you'd like to share with us? Well, I think the the first would be Hamid Bey, even though he wasn't alive. I felt like I was working with him because I, the first thing that I ever did that was outside of the world of Catholicism and structured religion, I went to a Coptic seminar. They're the first Catholic church, the Coptics, but they're very different than any. There's six acts of Catholic churches. I didn't realize that. There's six different ones. Coptics are one, and they do meditation. They do eating healthy. They actually, if you were a Coptic priest, you would eat a certain way your whole life so that when you died, they could cut you open and see if eating cucumbers every morning would make a difference. <laughs> you know, and they talk, so they were, wow. they were scientists. And that, that, that hit me and said, these people aren't just doing something seat of the pants. They're studying what they're doing. So, yeah. and I still, re I still carry his book on my phone because every once in a while, and he has other lectures. So books about his lectures. So I'll, I'll get something just to, and then I think Parahansi Gonanda was a big one because when he, when he talks about lighting the spark of the divine in the hearts of every person. That hit me because my heart was closed. I mean, I grew up in a family that emotions were not accepted. You know, you couldn't cry. You couldn't, and I'm almost crying just thinking about it because yeah. it was such an awakening when I started doing Kriya Yoga and doing the breath work, doing those kind of things. And then of course, the Kundalini was good, but I never really got to know Yogi Bhajan, but yeah. the, that was great. And then I think the, the third would be Richard Bandler even though he was kind of a, now he's mellowed out. He's, he's kind of cool now. But everybody told me, you don't want to go take training with him. He's, he's evil. I said, only if you let him be. I said, I, this guy's a genius. And so I wanted to learn how he did things because he could get people to move in directions. There's a lot of other people. I mean, I could probably yeah. name a hundred. I mean, one thing that my dad was very big on was training. I, if I read a book by somebody who liked it, I found a way to go train with them. Like Deepak Chopra, I told him when we got to meet with him and, and talk with him, which was awesome because the last time I talked with him was in 1989 when he just released his book, Quantum Healing. Oh, wow. And he was a big influence too. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's, there's so many. I mean, nobody could get where they are without a lot of people helping them. And, you know, when I, when I think back, it's uh, every day, I, the, that teacher always shows up, as they say. So yeah, I'm well, always looking for that, that newest piece of information, that new, new knowledge. I can see that. Yeah, we have a lot in common in that way, a thirst for, for truth and, and information. <laughs> Thank you for sharing so much with us today. It's been incredible. Well worth the wait. It's been a couple of years, man. So I'm glad we got to get together and also just hang out a bunch this weekend and get to know you. It's been really fun. And I appreciate what you're doing in the world very much and uh, very much aligned with your mission. And I love your technology, man. It's awesome. So I'm glad I got to really pick your brain on it. All right. Well, it's great being here. I mean, we we watch your lifestyle podcast, so it's great to be a part of it and uh, be part of the history of it and help train and motivate people. So. Awesome, man. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Thank you, man. <laughs>